Welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report, the region's longest running public affairs program. Legislative Report is a weekly review of activity at the state capitol featuring lawmakers from northeastern Minnesota. Most importantly, it's an opportunity for viewers to call or email their legislative questions and have them answered live on the air. Minnesota Legislative Report starts now. Hello and welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report. I'm your host, WDSC News and Public Affairs producer Greg Grell. Well, with conference committees at work on the major omnibus bills, Republican legislative leaders late this week released their budget targets. Now the real negotiations will begin with Democratic Governor Mark Dayton. This is your opportunity to talk with the lawmakers that represents you, so call in with your questions right now. Locally, you can dial 218. 788-2844. You're calling from outside the local area, say on the Iron Range, dial our toll-free number 1-877-307-8762. Those numbers will be on the screen throughout the show. You can also email your questions to askmlr at wdse.org. And now it's time to introduce the legislators. Join us in the studio. Great panel today, starting with Representative Jason Metza, Democrat from, uh, uh, from Virginia. Welcome. Thanks for having us, Greg. Representative Mike Sundin, a Democrat from ESCO. Great to be here. Representative Rob Eklund made the long trip down from International Falls. He's a Democrat as well. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate and Representative it. Mary Murphy, Democrat from Hermantown. And Representative Eklund, I mentioned the long trip down. Uh, you guys are trying to beat the storm to the Twin Cities tonight, so uh, stopping here on your way down. Yeah, it worked out, worked out well, real well, especially seeing what the weather report looks like. So It doesn't look good, but that's <laughs> the way this spring has been. Representative Sundin, as I mentioned in the uh, intro, Republican leaders released their budget targets on Friday. How does it match up with Democratic priorities? What did you think about uh, what you heard uh, from the Republicans on Friday? It's, uh, I guess, uh, the, the best word to use is uh, shortcomings, you know, across the board. Uh, they're, they're starving a lot of important programs uh, throughout the state. Maybe I'll get a reaction from each of you. Representative Metzo, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I really think that we could have done a lot more investment, uh, whether it be our schools. Uh, we still have a $600 million cut in Health and Human Services, which we discussed last time I was on a little bit. And uh, I think that part of that $1.1 billion target could have done, gone towards cutting less of those programs and investing more in other areas. And Representative Eklund, what about you? You're an assistant minority leader in the Democratic House. Uh, you have maybe a little bit of more input uh, on some of the budget priorities for the Democrats. What were your thoughts on what you heard? Well, it's just, I think it's alarming. Uh, I'm on the Environment Conference Committee and there's a $30 million cut between the DNR and the MPCA. And like I tell some of the people for the mill I work in when, in, my, in my other job, mm -hmm. that uh, when you're doing your air and water permits next year, uh, don't be surprised if the people you've been dealing with in the past either may not be there or it may take them longer to get back to you. So uh, as, far as, uh, as far as the uh, minority leadership team, we, we, uh, we're, we're support, supporting the governor's efforts and we're hoping that we can bring the targets more in line with what the governor's request is, but it's gonna be an interesting fall. Representative Murphy, what did you hear uh, as far as education uh, funding and some of the Republican priorities there? I haven't heard um, from the Republicans about the new target for um, education, but it's not what the governor was asking for for education, and so it definitely won't be 2% and 2% per pupil unit, and the early childhood programs will be severely shortchanged, and as well as every other finance program that we have. Um, it does keep the uh, tax appropriation high, so the rich 1% uh, will get some relief in taxes. But that's not what we're hearing at the community meetings and in our emails and when our conversations with our constituents. What we're hearing from the people of Minnesota is that we should be investing money in each of the, cate each of the categories so that now that we're paid up with the shortfalls that we had in the early part of the 21st century, we should be building the framework for the rest of the 21st century and for where we're going forward. And this budget uh, recommendation does not cut it. And Representative Sundin? Just a little follow-up on that, uh, that uh, the E-12 funding is actually gonna eliminate the funding for thousands and thousands of the pre-K students. And uh, 
the early learners uh, uh, are going to uh, be shortchanged on this. Mm -hmm. Now, Representative Eklund, the House and Senate uh, conference committees have been working now for about a, a week, week and a half on uh, the different omnibus bills. Uh, how are those bills progressing so far? What are, what are you hearing about progress uh, in the conference committees? Not much. <laughs> about all we did was policy uh, uh, last week in, in the conference committee I'm on, and uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, we adopted what they, what's called same and similars, and that's, that's the, how the ver Senate version and House version match up. Um, I, I assuming, I'm assuming tomorrow we meet half an hour after uh, the latest body adjournment and I'm assuming we're going to get into really discussing what the budget numbers are for after the joint targets were, were uh, released last week. And, and what conference committee is that? What bill are you working on? I'm, uh, I'm in Environment, Finance and Policy. Okay, okay. so important bill for uh, Northern Minnesota yep. especially. Representative Sundin, uh, you might have noticed, uh, and I've been reading about this a little bit, uh, Iron Range leaders have been working on bringing more rail competition uh, to the region, uh, especially on the Iron Range. That's a, that's a difficult issue with uh, there's not really any competition. Uh, is there anything that the legislature has been doing or anything they can do to uh, increase competition for uh, rail? Uh, you're on the Transportation Committee. I'm not sure if you've dealt with that, but maybe you have some thoughts. Well, we haven't dealt with that, but... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the rail safety is uh, probably the biggest issues that uh, we've been de dealing with over the years on that committee. And uh, to, I think you, uh, Jason Metza carried a bill for lighting Correct. in the rail yards. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as competition with the rail roads themselves, I, I couldn't speak to that right now. And Representative Metza, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I know that the yeah. some uh, different leadership uh, has been meeting on the range for quite a while on this issue. Yeah, so we've, uh, over the course of the last few years been working uh, to get more competitive rail and less captive rail, essentially not having us all uh, locked into just a small number of providers and that helps free up both uh, oil getting around goods from our, our trading partners and businesses here but as well as taconite getting uh, onto the boats yeah. in Superior. So. I know that uh, we've been looking uh, specifically with the IRRRB at uh, loosening up potentially some of the funding there through the Doug Johnson account to help with that. So we can keep you posted as we uh, inch towards having something more finalized. And Representative Eklund? Well, I, I'd like to comment on that, the rail safety and the rail competitive. I think competition is a good thing if we can do it right. But one example of what we need to think about from where the rail line crosses in, in Rainier, Minnesota, in my district, to Virginia, Minnesota, CN rail line crosses 38 bridges that go across our, our watershed. So if we're going to do it, I'm all for competition, but we've got to make sure it's done safely and correctly because it, it can't be slipshod. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Representative Murphy, we have a call from Bill in Hermantown, and he's wondering uh, what is the stas status of the Essentia Health uh, Wellness Center in the bonding bill? That's the wellness center that would propose to be built in Hermantown. Uh, that would be a community center. Well, it was in the bill bonding bill last year that didn't um, progress, and um, it's in the Democratic bonding bill. But we haven't seen the Republican bonding bill at all. It's in the drawer, and I have hints that it's going to come out of the drawer this week. But if the transportation um, finance proposal has bonding in it, a significant part of the transportation bonding will be the bonding that the Republicans want to um, levy this year. And so I don't know if that would relieve the local projects like the Essentia Wellness for South St. Louis County uh, project or not. I think that it is, if we have like $300 million has been suggested to me of transportation bonding that's usually in the transportation bill, not in the bonding bill. If that is in the Republican bonding bill, I suspect local projects will be eliminated. Representative Sundin? Uh, regarding the transportation uh, bill that uh, is being proposed, the funding for the transportation actually robs about $450 million from the general fund. 
Pardon me? I didn't know it was going to be yeah, that. Four, high. 450 <coughs> million from the general fund. That's the numbers we've been given. And uh, it's great for transportation. I think it sets a bad precedent for funding. I, I think a dedicated uh, gas tax is the way to go. And uh, moderate increases going forward uh, would uh, do the job for the state. Uh, to rob that money from the general fund, $450 million, that leaves education, health care, uh, nursing homes, uh, a lot of uh, crucial government services uh, at risk and fighting over the scraps uh, that are left. So uh, I'm in no way in favor of the uh, funding mechanism for the Republican transportation bill. It, it'll provide a, for like a 40% uh, reduction in bus buses bus service and uh, I think it's just designed to get get us through the next election cycle I think it's very uh, uh, a lot of political ties to that just uh, just to get the uh, uh, issue off the map for uh, another two years the representatives and Dean, before we move on to Representative Metza, Governor Dayton has indicated that he might accept that Republican bill because he says some bill is better than no bill because transportation funding has been shortchanged. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Do you agree that we need to do something with uh, funding for transportation this year? I, th I think I mentioned the funding mechanism that I prefer, and I disagree with, uh, wholeheartedly with the governor. All right, and Representative Metza on the, on the budget. Yeah, I think you know, and Representative Sundin can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when we're talking about this as well, that uh, 400 million, some of it's just one-time spending. And if we're giving away, and this is more for the viewers at home, if we're giving away the other uh, uh, 1.6 billion in the surplus uh, through rebates, some investments and in new programs, uh, essentially what we're setting ourselves up for is to be in a deficit situation in just a couple of years, which I think we, you know, the last time we actually passed a tax bill uh, that was significant and structural was when Democrats were in charge in 2013 and 14, and we've carried on with uh, surpluses. So I think Minnesotans need to be asking themselves if they want uh, to be in a position to have a structural deficit, they should get on their phones and start calling our Republican counterparts, specifically uh, Speaker Doubt, if they have a bonding project, like the wellness center that they wanna see get done. We need uh, and can use cash out of the general fund uh, to make some of those investments as well. So I'd encourage people to do that. All right, we received a call from Beverly in Duluth and Beverly, and we've talked about this on a number of uh, shows what's the status of the real ID bill that would be used for air travel representative Metza um, so you know right now with that essentially it's been locked up in conference committee the Senate passed a bill uh, what they call a clean bill and the house has not been willing to accept that bill so it's kind of held up right now uh, and I believe most of the members uh, on there at least in the Senate it was bipartisan agreement in the House, it seems to be a little bit more uh, partisan, uh, but it's House Republican uh, leadership and Senate Republican leadership have to come together so Minnesotans can travel. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a comment on Real ID? It seems like it's back and forth one week. It sounds like it's going to pass, then there's something else, and uh, we're all in limbo right now. Representative Eklund? Probably the only thing that you know, people wonder what's going on, to, but the, the bigger thing that, on this Real ID is we have to get something done because if you have a child that's a, a military age or a, a, a relative, if we don't have a real ID, you're not going to be able to go visit them on their base. It's as simple as that because you, you and, then, and then the air travel part, you're not going to be able, uh, be able to get on an airplane without, unless you have a passport. So, I mean, it's, it's critical. We, we're moving all the time. People are always moving about, about the country, about the world, and we need to get it done. Would a passport allow you to get onto a uh, military uh, to see your children? So a passport would work for it's, that as well? Yes. Okay. I right. think most of us here are probably comfortable with the Senate version of the bill as well, so. I would be. Okay. Uh, we got a call from John and Cook, and John is wondering, can you talk about any bills that are under consideration that will build internet access in rural areas? He says businesses need access. Uh, Representative Eklund, I'll start with you. Uh, I know this has been a, an issue for some of our, our legislators for several years to increase broadband access in well, rural areas. 
And that's a great question. There's, it's estimated that we're going to need $100 million a year for the next six or seven years to build out internet access to make everybody on the, uh, somewhat equal in the state. And the bills that are put forward this year just are woefully inadequate for that. What it was one version is seven million or something, yeah. another one's twenty-five million. That that won't do anything. And you know, I've been I where I live at in International Falls. If both both my wife and I have our laptop on at the same time, neither one of us get internet access. So so we only can <laughs> we can only use one computer at a time. It's it's pretty frustrating. And and uh, I I only live about four and a half miles from International Falls, so it's not like we're I'm way out in the sticks or anything. So. I'd certainly like to see more there, and, and we're doing everything we can as far as working with the companies. It's uh, kind of interesting, uh, the Cook and Orr and Ely just got some Blandon grants that will help build out the uh, uh, broadband issue. It's, 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 they're as much study grants as anything, so it's, uh, we need some real infrastructure to make it happen. So, Representative Sundin? As far as broadband service goes, uh, the importance for companies you know, in the re remote areas uh, you know, it's, it's a crucial thing, but I think more importantly, uh, as far as the education component goes, uh, we, we need uh, better service in, in these remote areas. When you've got students pulling into the parking lot of a hotel, motel, or the school or the library at night, and you see the lights on in the car, and they're doing their homework, that, that, that presents a problem. That's a, uh, it's a, detriment to their uh, uh, education experience. Mm -hmm. We had a call from John and Esco. I'm not sure if we have anybody that serves on the right committee, but he's wondering where, where is the bill in the legislature considering unregulated cell and Wi-Fi towers? Uh, is there a bill in that? Representative Metzo, you're not in your head. To yeah, so it's called the small cell wireless. Uh, and essentially that got a little hung up. The uh, companies like AT&T, Verizon, on others who are looking to deploy this technology, uh, which would essentially be very fast uh, internet on your cell phone at a cost to the consumer, of course. You're gonna be paying for this on your phone bill if you want uh, data usage, you're gonna pay for it monthly. If you go over, there's gonna be caps in how much you can use, so uh, it's not just something that the state's investing in and people get internet for free on their cell phone, so I don't want people thinking that. What it allows them to do is put up a tower on, say, a city light pole and distribute their signal, uh, I guess, on a more, uh, many more different locations than currently the signals being distributed from. People see the big cell towers from time to time. This would have a lot of smaller cell towers uh, across the communities. But our communities really need to sign off on this. And so that's been the main hang up right now is getting them on board uh, with allowing these companies to install their equipment and uh, who would be liable, things like that, if there were damage done. So that's all getting worked out and I think we should see something by the end of session. All right. We are watching Minnesota Legislative Report. This is your opportunity to call in and get your questions answered, answered by lawmakers who represent you, like Jim in Hermantown did. And Jim has got a question for Representative Murphy. Representative Murphy, Jim is wondering if the Hermantown School District receives $6,500 a student like others, but there's still a shortfall of $2,000 to $3,000 per student. She's, uh, Jim's wondering if open enrollment maybe would fix that, or uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the Hermantown School District situation and, uh, and education funding. I don't know. I think <coughs> Jim should call Mr. Chafee, but... Um, Open enrollment isn't a solution um, if for maybe either one of the school districts. If there isn't a seat for the child to sit in, um, you can't offer uh, an educational experience. And um, some of the seats in some of the classrooms in Hermantown are already closed and there's no offerings. Um, also, <coughs> I, I just don't think that's an answer, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't know um, enough of exactly about the numbers that he used or whatever mm -hmm. for me to speak of, but um, I don't, the main responsibility of the state is to fund and 
equal uh, educational opportunities to all students across the state. And when we don't budget fully, as the governor is suggesting this year, for public education, then the local school districts have to make up the differences. And that's a difficult thing for them to do, but they choose many different ways to do it. They have a referendum opportunity, they have uh, property tax rises opportunities. But most of the property tax rises go for the actual buildings and the equipment in the buildings not for the educational programming. The state's responsibility is the educational, always has been, is the educational programming opportunities. And that's supposed to be equal across the state. And it seems like in some instances, in some school districts, um, the because of the referendums and the various options the school districts choose, the equity of programming is um, changing and there's less opportunities uh, the further from the metro area you get. Mm -hmm. Representative Eklund, uh, you serve on the, uh, the uh, Agriculture Finance Committee in the legislature and we haven't talk much about that on legislative reports so far this year. Are there any issues, uh, measures uh, that came to that committee that folks in northeastern Minnesota might be uh, interested in learning about? I'd tell them to st uh, st uh, study up on buffers. That's, that's <laughs> probably the biggest hang up between in the Ag Bill and the Environment Bill is, uh, is uh, the buffers. And, and the governor's pretty strong on that. He, I think he looks at that as one of his uh, one of his accomplishments for, for his career as governor. and, and uh, Boy, we argue about them a lot, and, and uh, I, can, I can understand some of the farmers' concerns, but I think when you take a look at how we're blessed with so much clean water up here, um, there's something, something needs to be done with the, with the clean water projects down in the, in the ag area, because up here you can swim in virtually every lake. Down there, by the time you hit middle of June, end of June, you don't want to swim in any of those lakes. So there, there is a concern, and you're not, we're not going to fix it immediately, but uh, Again, buffers is probably the biggest hang up on that bill. Otherwise, that, that ag, bill, ag finance and policy bill is largely uh, non-controversial, unlike the rest of them. I think they actually had a, a zero cut in their, in their target, so they, oh. or maybe a 2%, a real small minor cut anyway, so. And we've got a question that kind of fits in there from Jim in Duluth, and he's wondering if there's a limit for how many fish we're supposed to eat because of contamination, why don't we clean up the water pollution? Well, that's a, that's a pretty big question, but uh, perhaps, Representative Sundin, you want to start on that? Uh, just back to the buffers a little bit and, and the clean water. If I, I've seen uh, uh, satellite images of the Red River of the North as it uh, travels into Canada, and it's just uh, just amazing that Canada hasn't uh, declared war on us because <laughs> of, <laughs> because of the uh, pollution that we're sending uh, uh, through that waterway. It's a, it's an embarrassment. The buffers are a good idea. How they uh, how, you know, we need some flexibility on how, how they uh, implement the buffer zones. The mapping has been done, I think, in 90 some percent of the state. So uh, actually we're in pretty good shape. There's uh, room for improvement. On that note, I did get a call from uh, one older gentleman and it was just the most amazing thing I've ever heard. He said, you know, a couple hundred years ago we took that land from the Indians fair and square. <laughs> and now you're trying to tell us what to do with it uh, with these buffer zones. It sounds like a land grab to me. <laughs> I thought, oh, okay. I understand where he's coming from now. So, but uh, no, it's it's our responsibility, and we should uh, we should step up and uh, and do what we can. And Representative Eklund. And and one other thing on the buffers, there are are um, ninety percent or a lot of counties in the state that are ninety percent compliant with the buffer rule right now, and and we're just dealing with some other ones, and there are some concerns. Um, it's old mapping, and they actually have done, had, uh, in a meeting we had last week when we were talking about the environment bill, they did take some of the, la some of the spots off that were designated as public waterways, and, and the DNR can clearly see that they weren't. It's probably not enough to uh, satisfy the critics, but it's a, it's a step in the right direction. It just shows that they're working with the different landowner groups to show that they, you know, they're hearing their concerns anyway. 
And before we move on, Representative Eklund, maybe we should just define the buffer zones and what they are so people who maybe aren't following this as closely know. Well, there's uh, uh, right now the governor's, governor's buffer proposal, and these, these uh, fine folks can correct me if I'm wrong, but on public waterways, I believe it's a, a 50 foot buffer. And so on, you wouldn't be able to farm or, or do anything along within 50 feet of a river or a lake? Is that well, correct? no, there, there could still be some farming, but they could plant like hay type crops and cover type crops where, they're, where it, it'll actually uh, filter out some of the uh, stuff that they're using on the fields, but it won't, wouldn't be corn and soybeans and that sort of thing right down the water edge. And then on private ditches, it's a 16 and a half foot requirement for the, for the buffers. So, um, and then there's a lot, of, a lot of other intricacies involved in it too, but that's, that's two basic ones is uh, 16 and a half feet on private and 50 on public. Okay. We have a call from Sioux in International Falls and uh, Sioux says, you know, understanding that many Republicans won seats the last uh, election based on helping rural Minnesota, She's wondering why not much has happened yet, i.e. internet services. Might be an unfair question since we don't have any Republicans on the panel today. We do invite Republicans every week and we will have Republicans on next week's show. It just depends on travel schedules. It's not, we're not trying to stack it one way or the other. But we, in fact, the matter is we have a lot more Democrats in our region than we do Republicans. But it's not that easy just to get elected to make things happen, right? I mean, our government system, it's a give and take. You've got two sides. So uh, I don't know who might want to start, Representative well, Eklund. I'll start <laughs> since it's uh, Sue from International Falls, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say right off the bat and be blunt, the pe purple of people of greater Minnesota that think the Republicans are helping out, they're not. It's as simple as that. They're not. They're with the, with the cuts to all the budgets, with the huge tax cut that's going to affect basically the rich and the corporations, we're not going to get the people in our income brackets aren't going to see a tax cut. We're not going to, our, our taxes aren't going to change any, and uh, they, they, there's not enough proposals to bring, bring jobs to greater Minnesota. It's, uh, I would say the, the GOP's budget process is wo woefully inadequate for greater Minnesota. And Representative Metzler? Yeah, you know, I'd have to agree. I think you're, uh, you know, kind of spot on with uh, what you had said too. We've had Republicans on the show this year, I know, and had some good conversations, but a lot of what we really need to focus on isn't getting done. And so I'd say the priorities that we have, uh, Speaker Doubt has ran an entire campaign statewide on giving back to greater Minnesota. And we've got bonding projects and no bonding bills. So any community across the state uh, and there's a whole heck of a lot of them who have project requests in, I think, to the tune of $600 billion in need around the state, uh, or uh, $6 billion in need, rather, uh, and those aren't getting funded. And it is about prioritizing. And in our tax bill right now, we don't have uh, anything that's getting done in terms of really providing relief to your average Minnesotan in a way that works for them. When you talk about tax credits, I want most people to think of how they file. They check the box for a standard deduction. A tax credit doesn't apply to you then. So you might hear that and think, oh, I'm getting a tax credit on something. And really, it's kind of a smoke and mirrors thing. There's no tax credit for you to take advantage of unless you, you know, make enough to go into an itemized uh, way, which you would be in a lot longer working on those. So. I think Representative Eklund's right, and we've got a delegation here in front of uh, you know all the viewers tonight who work really hard and make a point every day when we're at the Capitol to reach across the aisle and work together. And I don't think mm -hmm. that we're getting the same reciprocal uh, needs met in our districts for doing that. So it's kind of disappointing. Representative Murphy? Um, Sue was talking about education that goes back to broadband and so forth. And the chair of the Jobs and Energy and Technical Committee that spends money on technical things and jobs and energy um, is a very bright young man and uh, very vocal and has a different set of ideas of what Minnesota should be doing technology, in technology and energy, but especially in technology. And that is, um, it, he doesn't see that there's a need for sustainability of uh, the, the kind of technology broadband stabilizes it throughout the state. 
he said we'll have little cells around the state and different methods of delivering. But again, that goes back to what was said when Representative Metzel was talking about the small cell kind of stuff. It's expensive and it's on the phone, but schools across the state have technology, but the areas that the kids live in don't have it. And if the kids are going to do their homework so they don't have to drive at night, and they can't drive at night because the little kids are too little, and so they don't have just computers at school, they could have them at home, you need some kind of broadband that reaches all across the state. And also, um, Representative Graffalo, uh, the chair of that committee, has the philosophy that um, if it's viable, the people will be offered the service. But that goes back to to the olden days when you didn't have service outside of the core areas of the state and the rural Minnesota was non, didn't have services. And with all this comes along the protections that the consumers have worked so hard to be protected when there's public utilities. Nobody's talking about consumer protection in any of this new technology that's supposed to be in little cells and, and uh, just if you can pay for it, you can get it and otherwise you can't have it kind of stuff. And certainly the people in District 3B, Representative Eklund and I are listening to their stories about, about how businesses are ready to go, but not it ha they have to go between each other as well as in the town that they're in and you've got to have it everywhere. And with that comes responsibilities and protections for the consumers and so that the consumer can afford it. How some telephone bills are way over $100 these days. Right. And mm -hmm. with the internet on it, how many homes can afford that for four, four, four or five different people? I, it's just a thing that's just growing. I'm so we need answers for every part of the state. And when we ask those questions, it's just kind of scuffed at. No, but we're working toward that goal. Now, Representative Metzler, you, you brought up uh, the tax bill in your last answer, and I wanted to ask you about the omnibus tax bill, maybe some measures in there that folks might be interested in learning about. You talked a little bit about the tax bill. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's, and I, I shouldn't, you know, when we get partisan on these things, we shouldn't say that everything in every bill is terrible because it's not our party. I don't <coughs> think that's the intent. No. There's some great stuff in every mm -hmm. one of these bills. I've got, uh, I think, legislation, almost every omnibus bill out there except the transportation bill this year. One of them we talked about before, uh, the Social Security cap increase, which will help seniors all over the state uh, with, with some needed relief as they aren't seeing uh, increases in their pensions uh, and or Social Security and uh, in the monthly payments anyway. And so we've got that, uh, but there are some pretty big hiccups in there too. And I know I saw Representative Sundin has some written down here that he was concerned about. And mm -hmm. so Mike, you wanna take one of those? Sure. Thanks for hosting yeah. the show. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, the the, ta the the tax breaks uh, for the corporations, uh, and uh, it, it's just obscene what's what's happening there. And th there again, that's a drain on the rest of the uh, budgetary process. And uh, there's a 161 million dollar estate tax cut. Uh, you know, that's another drain if, if that were to uh, succeed in, in, in uh, this year, but. Uh, I've also got a reminder here at the bottom of my page, my notes here, about the property tax refund. A couple of years ago, we actually uh, restructured a little bit of that. So there's, there's uh, more money available for uh, property tax refunds. So people that uh, think they would not qualify, uh, they, they will be qualifying. So uh, it doesn't uh, take much to apply for it. You can go online. Uh, to the Department of Revenue and Google property tax refund. You can actually do it online, get it done by August 15th. There's a lot of people uh, that are leaving money on the table there. So 
check into the property tax refund. All right, um, Representative Eklund, we had a caller who wanted to know about the, quote, Enbridge situation. Uh, I believe this is probably talking about some of the pipelines that are being proposed to be either improved or expanded. Uh, what do you know about that? Some of this is state, some of it is federal, is uh, kind of a combination of things involved here. Well, first off, my view is pipelines are necessary and needed, but they have to be done the right way. They have, they, they have to follow science, they have to follow the proper permitting, and where our uh, uh, several proposed are, are through Native American land, so we have to take in the cultural issue on, on that. But I think it's a, that's a good uh, segue into what I talked about, the railroad crossing 38 waterways. So we hear a lot of the, about pipelines threatening wild rice waters. Those 38 bridges that, that train crosses between International Falls and Virginia, there's an awful lot of wild rice water in that area too. And what a lot of people don't realize on that rail traffic is there is a lot of oil and other chemicals that are on those trains mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. It's a good point of entry and I'm certainly happy that CN is running through my district because it provide, provides a lot of uh, employment. But it's also, it's sparsely populated so it's easier to contain a problem if there is a problem. Uh, a, couple, a couple of years ago, we had a, a rail bridge start on fire over the Rat Rut River just south of International Falls. And luckily for all of, all of us that live in that area, that was a potash car that went into the river. If it had been an oil car that went into the river, we could have had some serious environmental problems. So we've got to balance the whole thing out between rail traffic and pipelines. Um, pipelines are the quickest and most efficient way to move oil, but it needs to be done properly. Representative Sundin, that is kind of the, the battle, right? The pipelines versus rail for carrying oil. Either one, you know, sometimes there can be an environmental problem, but it's a tough decision. Absolutely. There's about 79,000 rail cars that are of substandard uh, tankers that are of substandard construction. They're uh, being replaced slowly by uh, 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 newer models with uh, heavier bulkheads and a double bulkhead, and uh, th that's a good thing, but there's still 79,000 of these uh, time bombs uh, out there. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, Representative Eklund and I share an apartment uh, down in St. Paul, and we're within just a couple hundred yards of a rail line that has got oil, bulk and oil uh, on it constantly. So if that oil were to spill, and get into the sewer system and, and ignite, uh, we would have one big mess down in St. Paul. But uh, yeah, it's, it's d definitely a, a, a key problem. I spoke on the House floor a couple weeks ago on this issue, and uh, it, it all comes down to the routing. You know, it's uh, a lot of people say it's not in my backyard. Some people say build absolutely nothing anytime, you know. But uh, the energy will have to move. and it's going to move in pipelines and the routing uh, went well in Carleton County. We had an, uh, an adult at the table that uh, somewhat mediated the routing uh, with Enbridge and uh, the local farmers and came to a real good solution. Uh, that didn't happen all over the state. There's still some sore spots, but I believe it's 90, 95% of that route, uh, line three replacement route is uh, in place. And uh, I, I think we just need a couple more adults at the table when it comes down to routing. Representative Eklund? Well, and there's uh, one thing that we uh, need to realize is that these, these pipelines are great revenue builders for your local governments, municipalities, counties, school mm -hmm. districts, because they all get a share of what the tax is that, that comes through on those pipelines. So. Um, that's sometimes that's le sometimes that's left out of the equation, and it take and that takes a lot of, of relief from the county governments from for tax levies and thing like, things like that. And the new pipelines have better linings, better better technology now that now they can pinpoint if there's a problem versus what some of the old. So they're building them better now than what they used to be too. And, and it's so it's I mean everything is. Uh, Everything, everything relies on technology to make things better, and we're, we're and we are progressing that way too. So, mm -hmm. all right, and you are watching Minnesota Legislative Report. Your opportunity to call in with questions now to the lawmakers that represent you, uh, Representative Metza. A few weeks back, we had you on the show, and we talked about the the measure that you're uh, 
that you are suggesting, which is a statewide vote on the recreational use of marijuana. Before I get into a question we have from Jim in Virginia, first just kind of set that up. What exactly are you proposing? Yeah, so what I'm currently proposing is a ballot measure uh, by the Constitution in Minnesota, which uh, for folks who want to know what that is, it's what they would have recently voted on with legislative uh, compensation. And so that was on the ballot this last cycle, if you remember that. Uh, the legacy funding, I believe, was the uh, another ballot measure we had on mm -hmm. previous in 2008. And uh, what this would do is allow every Minnesotan who's registered and at the polls uh, and legal to vote to go in and vote just like we would at the Capitol as to whether they would like to see this become law or not, should it pass uh, you know, through the committee process at the Capitol first. And it would essentially allow those uh, over 21 to uh, legally acquire and consume uh, recreational uh, use of cannabis. And what that would allow us to do is put it into a regulated uh, marketplace. We modeled the enacting language after Colorado, which could be changed after and would regulate uh, marijuana much like alcohol. So Jim listened to that conversation or perhaps had uh, read about your, your bill and he asked, in light of legislation in Minnesota aimed at reducing smoking in the state, how do you justify the legislation of marijuana, which is generally smoked, not always, but generally? Yeah, I would say that that would be up to individuals. They're all adults uh, who would be partaking in that and you know, cigarettes aren't healthy. I've made it actually 60 days now, uh, quit smoking cigarettes and so, uh, it's a tough habit to quit and wouldn't encourage anyone to start. So uh, I think that uh, when we're dealing with things like this though, with a prohibition that I believe has failed over many years and we have one in five adults in Minnesota who admit to using uh, that substance uh, on an annual basis at least, then we really need to take a look at it and have a statewide conversation. That's the intent of the bill I put together. And do you see it regulated much like alcohol would be regulated in the state then? Yep. You know, in a perfect world, we'd have it regulated uh, like alcohol. Uh, you taxed know, like, as well. Taxed as well uh, with the savings and current enforcement is about 80 million a year. And the estimated revenue uh, generated would be about 170 million. We'd see about a quarter of a billion dollar swing. Uh, right now, again, we modeled it off what Colorado did and we'd uh, put that towards education and uh, you know that would be some much needed funding for our uh, friend from Hermantown who called earlier and wanted to know about the, the per pupil funding. That would be something that would uh, increase that significantly. Anybody else at the, Representative Murphy, you'd like to comment? I would like to say that it's not like that. Um, it would be, that's the way to do it. But the first step is to go to the federal authorities go to Nolan, go to Franken, go to Klobuchar, and get the federal laws changed. Because the federal law is outlines, or outlaws cannabis as anything. And it, for Minnesota to go ahead and proceed is leading people down the wrong path. You're leading them down to felonies, or at least gross misdemeanors, or simple misdemeanors because if Minnesota enacts a law or a statute saying they can do that, the feds could walk in on any day, although they haven't in Colorado and they haven't in Oregon and they haven't in California, but we have no evidence to show that they're not going to wa walk in in Minnesota and the feds should stand up and make the law for the federal nation and Minnesota's laws should follow the federal law rather than blindfold the Minnesotans that think, oh, the legislature vote about it. We should have a conversation. That's fine. But a constitutional amendment in Minnesota when the federal government is still saying you can't do it, we'd be back to a real ID mm -hmm. situation. And you know how well that's working. 
Representative Metzl, how does Colorado handle that? Is it, is, it, is it a constitutional amendment there as well? Or? Well, so states have typically taken it. I think every single one actually so far that's passed it has brought it to the voters. And I think it's more of a state's uh, way of saying, and Mary and I may disagree on this a little bit, uh, I think it's our responsibility to show through our voting populace that a majority of our citizens are in support of this, not only the folks at the Capitol, which is why, again, it's a good conversation mm -hmm. to have at the Capitol to get it on the ballot, I believe. Uh, but at the same time, if enough states take this course of action, which there are more uh, doing it this year, then the federal government will have a really good idea of what they're uh, dealing with and what you know, kind of the will of the country is at that point with those vote totals. And I believe uh, as well that this could be dual track, uh, much to what uh, Representative Murphy had said. And there's no reason we shouldn't be contacting our federal legislators. I know uh, uh, Mr. Sessions recently uh, said that the previous administration's uh, enforcement policies seem to be working. And so I think the states that have voted to legalize this uh, are feeling a lot better about that currently, uh, although it's not definitive at this point, uh, nor will it be, uh, to Representative Murphy's point, until our federal legislators take action and reverse the prohibition of it being a Schedule I uh, for a research point and to decriminalize and uh, legalize for recreational use, which would be a separate uh, action that they would have to take. Uh, we have a call from Paul in Ely. Paul works for the state. He's concerned that the state could be shutting down or having a special session. Uh, anybody want to comment on that? Is there any indication that uh, we're going to have a government shutdown? They've been talking about it on the federal level, so maybe that's what's concerning Paul about the state level. Representative Sundin. I, I think uh, the word that we should be using here is mismanagement uh, at the state level right now. Uh, we've got uh, a couple hundred legislators are showing up doing their work, but I, I really believe that the, there's a management problem as far as getting through the tail end of the uh, session here. So um, I, I'm probably in agreement with them that there's a good chance of uh, a special session or not finishing on time uh, with the Republican leadership. I don't have a lot of faith in getting out of there on the due date. And Representative Eklund? Well, and I, I'm, I'm you know, the newest one at the table here on this, but in the past when we've had <coughs> government shutdown or need for a special session, it's because we've had a budget shortfall. When we've got a $1.65 billion surplus, there's absolutely no, no reason for us not to get our work done and get it done on time. So I would agree with Representative Sundin on that, that there's, uh, there's been some uh, mismanagement of what's going on and we should, be, we should be further along in the process right now than we are. Representative Metzl. Yeah, I would uh, also just like to add, Minnesotans should be watching, I think, the Senate very closely right now. Uh, they've got a lot closer vote margin than we do in the House. It's a one vote swing and so they've been uh, forced on almost every major bill that's gone through to compromise and come up with something uh, that was palatable uh, both to the minority and the majority parties. And uh, I think that the Senate's a lot closer to where we'd all like to be in terms of our compromising uh, when we're looking at a lot of the major spending bills, uh, they were a lot less, uh, I, there were a lot less cuts in the Senate than there were in the House. And I think that, uh, you know, the House leadership has to really take a look, uh, again, at the bonding bill, which we've mentioned hasn't come out yet. We're getting really close to kind of what happened last year, where a bill was thrown out, what, about 15 minutes before session got done? typos in there uh, with a billion dollar typo in terms of appropriation that's not what we should be doing right now literally it's so quiet there you could hear the crickets chirp and a pin drop uh, in terms of the day-to-day -day business that's getting done outside of the conference committees very few bills getting passed uh, in the week and I remember when we were in the majority we had session every single day and we're passing small bills uh, every single day. And so I'd encourage people to reach out uh, to Governor Dayton. He's got to be willing to come to the table and listen. Uh, but at the same time, I think the House leadership in, in particular in this case really needs to uh, listen to their Senate counterparts and come a little closer to what's been proposed over there to get some real headway and avoid any special sessions or 
uh, gridlock at the end here. All right, we have a call from Larry in Hermantown. This is kind of an annual question. Larry's wondering, would any of the legislators freeze property taxes or do away with them altogether for senior citizens, especially if their only source of income is Social Security? I'll start with you, Representative Metzo. You serve on the tax committee. Uh, no, I don't think that that would be a fair uh, way to do it. I think that local governments collect property taxes for a reason. That's to have county functions of government, our county roads working, uh, and other county services and as well as our local city services, which the county gives a portion of those taxes collected to our local cities and or townships. Uh, and so I think that you know eliminating them is probably not realistic. Now, could the state take some of the big surplus we have and invest, like Representative Sundin said, in more property tax relief and do it targeted towards people specifically on Social Security? Absolutely, we could be doing that right now today uh, but the majority uh, has not prioritized that this year, and so uh, it won't be happening. But that, would, that is something I would definitely be open to. And to be clear, uh, the property taxes are levied by the local government bodies. They're not levied by the state, but you would have some sway over them. Yep, we can provide relief, uh, but it would be a pretty drastic change from the way we've done business since our state's inception to take the right to levy those taxes away from the local um, municipalities uh, and or county governments. And Representative Sundin? You know, one thing a lot of people do not do is uh, they don't plan to die, you know. Uh, uh, I'm paying more taxes now than I uh, ever dreamed of uh, possible. I'm probably paying more taxes than uh, that amount uh, than what I've made in the first couple, few years of uh, work in my working life. But uh, people need to uh, plan for the future a little bit and uh, and realize that uh, you're going to pay higher taxes is if you don't have those deductions of the children that type of thing and then when it comes down to the property taxes you know they they still use the roads they still use uh, public services uh, we all need to pay uh, but we do a, a better job here in Minnesota than a lot of other states as far as equity for people in, in the taxes, uh, property taxes, we have that refund uh, that I mentioned earlier, and I think everybody should uh, look into that, especially if they're elderly, if they've changed jobs, income changes, a death in the family, whatever, uh, check into that uh, renters and uh, tax, property tax refund. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Eklund? Well, I, uh, before my stint down here at the legislature, I came from the county board, and one thing that I've tried to be true to down here is when I was on the county board, we did not like state government telling us what we can and can't do. And so I'm more for the small government, municipal government. Uh, that's where they get the real work done and they have to answer the property tax owners, or property tax payers. But one thing we could do is uh, uh, through, through this surplus, provide some tools for the counties to use like increase county program aid, increase PILT, increase local government aid because those are, the, those are the things that we could do now with a surplus, and then that would allow the counties to provide some tax relief to their, to their uh, property taxpayers. Representative Metz, uh, one thing we haven't talked much about during our, uh, during our show this, this spring has been funding for outdoors, and uh, a lot of uh, government, uh, I should say state agencies like the DNR, a lot of outdoors groups are calling for increased licensing fees for fishing, hunting, in order to be able to do more with the outdoors. But so far, there really hasn't been any movement in that direction. Uh, Sam Cook wrote a big article about this, or, yeah. edit, or a column about it in the Duluth News Tribune today. Just wanted you to comment on that a little bit, what your thoughts are. You serve on one of the committees that deals with outdoors. Yeah, so I think uh, overall that when a group comes to us, and I'll speak specifically to my local snowmobile club uh, in my region, and I know many of the other clubs have had these exact same interactions with their legislators, whether it be uh, you know fishermen and women, uh, and or deer hunters. Uh, they're requesting these increases themselves so that the state can provide better services uh, and provide them the experience they're looking for when they're going to enjoy uh, the great outdoors which we have up here and all across the state. And so Snowmobile Club essentially had one concern and that was when the DNR is managing these services and the fee increase that they get capped at an administrative fee. 
And so I think we were able to satisfy that this year and got it put into one of our bills in the Environment Committee. And hopefully those folks will, you know, continue to advocate for it, but we don't have the increases right now, so. Mm -hmm. Representative Eklund, we have just under two minutes left, just so you know. So the only fee increase that's in the Environment Bill right now is for state parks. And every group across the state of Minnesota, outdoors group, has asked for fee increases. Yeah. But I think if you go back to the plenty years when he put a lot of fee increases on a lot of things and they got hammered on calling a fee as just another three letter word for tax. So I truly believe that the majority party is real concerned about putting fees on and then getting nailed as, as tax increases. But every group across the state has asked for a fee increase. And when I buy my deer license or fishing license or whatever I go to do, I'm going to buy the license anyway. The outdoors people are going to buy the license anyway, and they, they want it. And just so you know, if this doesn't happen, my folks in Tower and Ely that had a hard time with snowmobile grooming last year, trail grooming, if there are no fee increases, it'll be worse in the upcoming mm -hmm. winters because the DNR will have less money to operate with. All right, well, we're about ready to wrap it up here, and I want to thank all of you for being here today. Representative Mary Murphy from Hermantown, Representative Rob Eklund from International Falls, Representative Mike Sundin from Esco, and Representative Jason Metza from Virginia. Thanks very much for being here. Good luck next week at the legislature. We are out of time this week on Minnesota Legislative Report. Don't forget, uh, thanks to our crew here in the studio. Thanks to everyone who called or emailed with their questions today. Please join us again next week for our final show of the legislative session. I'm Greg Grell. Have a great evening.